Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're in week four of our fundraising during uncertain times series. Uh, I have to say, I was hoping our title would be outdated by now, but as far as I can tell, things are still uh, uncertain. I hope many of you are finding your bearing fundraising in this environment, but uh, a lot of questions, of course, still remain. Even if we are getting more used to working from home constantly, there isn't much certainty about how long we'll be here, when we can start seeing donors or hosting events, or even what the economy will look like once things are back to normal, so to speak. So we're still here trudging through these uncertain times together. I'm uh, Austin Detweiler, I'm the managing editor of Philanthropy Daily. If you are just joining us, you can catch our previous webinar recordings on major gifts, direct response, and events on our website, philanthropydaily.com, as well as a whole host of uh, resources for fundraising today uh, with articles tying into each of our webinars. If you want to remember a time when everything wasn't about coronavirus and pandemics and quarantines and curves, you might check out our spotlight section that highlights uh, our favorite articles from the archive. So those come from a time when coronavirus was not on our minds, uh, when we were still promoting the value of human contact over isolation, if you can believe it. So that might be a welcome distraction for you. Uh, but you're all here today to think about fundraising in the midst of pandemic and today to discuss foundations fundraising. So for that, we have Rudy Carrasco from the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust with us, along with Justin Streif to uh, help guide the conversation. If you are compelled at all to draw back on foundation outreach, Rudy and Justin will put that temptation to rest, I am sure. Um, but I just want to remind everyone that foundations are legally required to disperse 5% of their assets each year. Obviously, it's a little more complex than that with the tax law and everything, but foundations can't just stop giving money the way individuals can. So uh, beyond that, many organizations are also cutting into their corpus. They're striving in various ways to be more grantee friendly. Uh, as I'm sure Rudy will say more, he, like many foundation staff, is unusually busy right now. So rather than pulling back or hunkering down, Murdoch, like so many others, is uh, stepping up to meet the needs of their grantees. For one example, just yesterday, a client of mine received an email from a foundation donor letting them know about the changes they're doing with regard to reducing reporting requirements, changing deadlines, even converting program-specific grants into general operations as necessary. You can see uh, a lot of community foundations around the country are digging deep to support their local communities. Uh, and other good news like that. I heard another idea for foundations to host a Zoom call for their grantees in a specific area so they can get together, discuss their work, how they're weathering the storm, and so on. If you saw Gene Diamond's article in Philanthropy Daily this morning, he mentions this sort of new willingness to collaborate now. We're all uh, stuck at home, forbidden to travel, and so suddenly the barriers to collaboration are actually fewer and smaller. I don't have to come to you to, to work with you. I can just hop on a Zoom call. Uh, in some ways, it's easier. One final thing for me before I pass it off, uh, I was speaking with a foundation representative this morning, and he was reminding me that applicants need to be thinking carefully about how their work is affected by the pandemic. And that's both now and once we move beyond this, it's going to be on reviewers' minds whether applicants can show that they're sensitive to what this means for their program priorities. So. As we've been saying, stay the course, charge ahead, but don't be reckless. Uh, work on the tactical shifts that you need to adjust your fundraising and especially your messaging to, to meet the current exigencies in this new environment. For more on that, actually, again, Liz Palla's article in Philanthropy Daily earlier this week talked about that. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to our panelists. Our guest today, as I said, is Rudy Carrasco. He's a program director with the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust in Vancouver, Washington. Rudy's been with Murdoch for a few years, but before that, he spent a career in fundraising. So we're glad to have him bringing a foundation perspective to this conversation, but he has been on both sides of the grants world. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Murdoch. They've been around since 1975, using their significant resources to strengthen educational, social, spiritual, and cultural life in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and Rudy, as I said, has been in the nonprofit sector his entire career, working in development domestically and internationally, community development. 
Uh, as a program director now, Rudy works one-on-one -on -one with applicants and grantees to help walk them through the application process. So his perspective here will be invaluable uh, and we're glad to have his time uh, right now. With Rudy, we have uh, Justin Streif, again, a partner with American Philanthropic. He'll get us started in his career as a fundraiser and even more so now at American Philanthropic. Justin works with hundreds of foundations every year, stewarding open grants, applying for new and renewed grant funding and seeking new uh, institutional donors for nonprofits of all types around the country. Before I hand it over to Justin, Final reminder, please send your questions in. Justin and Rudy have some opening remarks here, but then we'll jump into an open Q&A for about 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, if you scroll your mouse, activate your Zoom screen, you'll see the Q&A button near the bottom. Click that and you can send questions directly to us. Uh, keep in mind that we have about, you know, approaching 1,000 guests with us today representing all kinds of nonprofits. So we wanna keep the questions as general as possible. But that said, Rudy can also help you think through uh, how to approach foundation donors and discuss how this pandemic might be affecting your open grants in particular. So please start sending questions as you have them. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna kick it over to you, Justin. Awesome, thanks so much, Austin. So as we've discussed in uh, some previous webinars, major gifts, uh, events, and uh, direct mail, we've talked about this idea of being near, dear, and clear to your donors. And this is especially true during a time of crisis. And just as a recap on that, because this applies to foundations, is again, being near your donors means staying in close contact with them during this time. Again, should always be doing this, but especially during this time. Being dear to your donors means drawing them closer to you and your organization. Uh, that's through empathy and a real human relationship uh, and open communication. And then being clear means clearly communicating to your donors the work that your organization does and the impact you're having, generally speaking. But then being clear in this time means uh, discussing with them and making it clear what their support makes happen during this time of, of pandemic or uncertainty. Uh, so again, this idea near, dear, and clear doesn't really necessarily only apply to individual donors. It also applies to foundations and both staffed foundations and unstaffed foundations, the big institutional ones and the family foundations. And uh, so why is this? Why does this still apply here? It's, uh, it's because, and if you've heard or been interacting with Philanthropy Daily or American Philanthropic at all uh, in recent years, you would have heard this. It's because people give to people and foundations are people too. Uh, we hammer away at this with all of our clients at Amer American, Philanthrop American Philanthropic, all of our trainings. Um, because it's all too easy to take foundations and put them in their little bucket and say, well, those are those people and we'll communicate to them and deal with them in one way. And then these are the rest and we'll, we're going to always stay in touch with them and do this other track of communication. Uh, that's not true. Behind uh, those foundations are people. There are program officers. So treat foundation givers and foundation program officers like they're people because they are. Uh, treat them like you treat their other, your other major donors. Again, near, dear, and clear. Uh, of course, I want to obviously be sensitive to the fact that a lot of foundation fundraising can seem transactional rather than relational and, and human. And that's because there's guidelines and deadlines and boards and restrictions and bylaws and benchmarks and KPIs and all this stuff. And that all rolls up to, it really kind of can often seem like it's sucking the human life of that relationship, um, but it's not. Again, there's, there is a human behind that, all of that. And um, so, what I want to say is this all makes it, again, seem like foundation fundraising is transactional and not relational, uh, making it seem like it's hard to be near, dear, or clear with someone. Because again, it's, there's a portal or whatever it is. It's hard to be near and dear with that portal. Um, but that's not the case. Behind all these, those ho uh, hoops and forms and grant portals, there is a person. Uh, and if you've had any success in foundation fundraising before, it's probably because you've cultivated a relationship with a foundation contact. You've likely established a rapport with them and a great working relationship with the foundation contract or the pro, a contact of the program officer. And you're treating that contact like you would any of your other major donors. And uh, that's probably why you've had that success. And during any crisis uh, or time of uncertainty, I recommend that fundraisers get in touch with their foundation contacts early and often. And we talked about this 
with events, you know, last week or, or yeah, last week, if you have a big event sponsor, get in touch with them right away and let them know what's going on. Your major donors, get in touch with them right away. Same thing with foundations, get in touch with them early and often. Um, and so, uh, and this is the case, even if they haven't renewed in 2020, if they're not renewing until August or December or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Get in touch with them, all of them right now. And when you do get in touch with them, here are a couple things to keep in mind that I would suggest keeping in mind is first, start with the human side of this. Find out from your foundation contact how they're faring in this crisis. Be personal with them. Find out how the foundation is responding to the crisis, how they might be pivoting on their priorities. Uh, again, interacting with them like they're human. I'm, I'm, how are you guys dealing with this? Um, that is really important. Start with that, lead with that. Uh, update them on how the crisis is affecting you and your organization. Um, it, it's impacting everybody in some way. Maybe it doesn't impact your programs, but it almost certainly will impact your fundraising. Uh, but maybe it doesn't, isn't impacting your fundraising. It's probably impacting your programs. Um, so talk to them about that. Update them on how you're, how you're doing and how you're responding. Are you canceling programs or events and how is that going? Uh, and then of course, if you're in the middle of a grant, let them know if and how that crisis might be affecting your ability to fulfill the grant terms. Uh, and then bring recommendations. Don't just call up Rudy or whoever and say, well, we're, you know, like, oh man, all of our programs are being canceled, that's crazy. Rudy will probably talk about this in a second, but the first question he's going to probably ask is, great, what are you doing about it? <laughs> and so be prepared to answer those questions and have that in mind. Don't just call uh, with, with questions and kind of this vague, you know, purpose for, for a conversation. Call and have that call with purpose uh, and have, have your questions or answers to anticipated questions. Um, and then start thinking about, determine if there's an opportunity for a new or additional a uh, grant from that foundation in light of the crisis. Um, ask them are there specific grant areas they've introduced to respond to, to COVID that your organization might qualify for. Um, maybe there's an upgrade there because you've had to shift a currently funded program and it costs a lot more now to do it online or whatever it might be. Talk about that with that program officer. And finally, um, so ask how you could be a res resource to that program officer. It, it, it's a two-way street. Um, ask if they would like recommendations on groups that might fit their giving priorities during this crisis. Ask if there's any additional reporting you can provide on your grant during this. Do they want more? Do they want less? Um, ask them about that. Ask them if, if they'd like some sort of uh, COVID response plan from your organization, your one page or two page, how are you, how are you uh, pivoting your organization given this crisis? Um, and if they have not renewed in 2020, cut to the chase. Uh, ask if they'd like to, you, you to apply along the same timeline as last year. Uh, ask if they'd like to see your organization's, again, COVID response plan. But importantly with all of this, do not assume, and we talked about this with the major gifts, uh, the very first webinar, don't assume that they won't renew or they're, that they're going to decrease or that they would never un entertain an upgrade. Don't assume those things. Many foundations are stepping up uh, and increasing their giving. You maybe have seen a few articles about this. You know, uh, 500, there was read one the other day, 500, something like 492 foundations said they were gonna step up and give extra this year. Uh, there were a couple that just said they were doubling their giving this year to deal with this crisis. So don't assume that they're, they're not gonna step up their game. Also, many also take steps to shield themselves from market downturns. Sometimes they take that 5% that Austin uh, mentioned and they move that into a cash fund because they know they have to uh, use it. So maybe they move it over to a cash fund and they've got that separated and, and shielded from market downturns. Um, or maybe just they want to help more during this crisis, not less. Uh, and they're willing to dip, dip into that corpus. So don't be afraid to ask um, and to dig in on that. And again, don't be afraid to keep asking. Again, as Austin said, foundations are legally required. It gets messy, but they're, they're, they exist to give away money. And so uh, keep on asking. And on top of that, uh, your mission and your organizational success depend on donations, and those donations come from asking. So if you're like most nonprofits, you can't afford to not ask. And so you need to keep on going, but again, be sensitive to what's going on uh, and, and the, the pandemic that's out there. Um, all this also applies to prospective foundations. I've heard from some folks, should we stop prospecting? You know, there, no one's ever going to take on a new grantee in 20, you know, April 2020. 
Uh, and I would push back on that uh, for a couple reasons. Um, and I should preface it with, sure, there are probably a lot of foundations that are focusing, they're giving just on COVID or maybe tightening the belt or maybe saying, we know what, we just can't accept new grantees. That's, that's absolutely the case. There are definitely gonna be foundations out there that are doing that, but don't let that stop you from, from prospecting. Um, again, your mission requires donations. The way to get the donations is to ask and sell, send the LOIs and you've got to keep doing that. So you really uh, can't afford uh, most organizations to hit pause on cash flow. You just, you can't. So we got to keep moving forward. Um, and, and, um, and just keep in mind as well with that, you know, anyone who's done foundations before, uh, outreach before, really it can take anywhere from best case scenario, three months from outreach to getting a, a check in the mail. But realistically from all of us, it's probably more like six to nine to 12 to 18. Uh, sometimes for the big ones, it could take years from introduction to, to getting that check. So if you pause, even for a month or two or six months, all you're doing is hurting yourself in that next fiscal year or the, for the fiscal year after that, because you're, you're now cutting off the beginning of that whole six to 12 to 18 month process. So, so don't shortchange yourself down the road. Um, now, some other things to keep in mind here um, as you conduct outreach to active and prospect foundations. And uh, after this, I'll hand it off to Rudy. But first, take advantage of this opportunity as a chance to have a natural lead in to a conversation with the foundation. Again, ask them how things are going in their neck of the woods. Uh, start with, with that. We want to be sensitive. We're human beings. We like that relationship. Uh, start with that. Show that the true care for, for what's going on. Uh, second, make sure your letters and communications, or letters of inquiry, meeting request letters, uh, your, your proposals, make sure they acknowledge the crisis at, at hand. We talked about this in direct mail two weeks ago. Um, if you send a direct mail letter and you just jump right into your mission, that could come across as relatively insensitive um, and tone deaf. So don't, don't do that. Just approach it with, we understand what's going on out in the world today. Uh, we, it's a struggle for, for many. Uh, we hope you and your family are safe and healthy. And then you can start moving into uh, talking about, you know, getting a meeting or at the LOI. Um, so, and then keep in mind that it might be harder than before to get in touch. People are working from home, they're changing processes, they're they may be taking on a whole new wave of unexpected grant proposals uh, that they never expected two months ago. Now they've got a pile of COVID pr grant proposals that program officers need to go through. Um, they might also be checking on, in on current grants and grantees to make sure that those are on track. So your LOI, I'm not, you should absolutely move forward if you're prospecting, but don't expect that program officer pick up the phone right away and say, hey, got it in the mail. What's going on? Let's chat. They probably have a stack of work more than usual uh, on their desk right now. Um, and then fourth, uh, even though you're busy, uh, don't let up. Remain vigilant, focused, disciplined, and continue to strive and continue to hammer away at that prospect found, uh, prospecting with foundations. Uh, again, you don't want to shortchange yourself down the road. And to cap off my remarks before handing it to Rudy, I, I want to reiterate what we talked about a lot last week in the events a webinar, which is connecting your mission um, to, to your outreach and what's going on in the world, making sure your mission is front and center. So what we just talked about being sensitive to what's going on, you don't want to come across as, as tone deaf to the situation. Uh, continue with that. Um, how can you tie what you do with what's going on in the world? Sure, you, you might not be feeding the poor or building vendors, uh, but almost certainly your mission still matters in some way. And uh, you just need to draft that persuasive argument as to why your mission still matters today. So again, if you're, um, you, you know, there was someone a few weeks ago that asked me, I, I think I brought this up on a, on a different call. Someone asked me, well, we provide instruments to a low income students so they can participate in music class at school. How do we make that pitch relevant to, to what's going on in the world today? And I, I flipped that and said, it's, it works perfectly, actually. People are out of jobs, you know, they're, they're being furloughed, incomes are down, uh, economic uncertainty, folks are looking to cut back expenses. Well, instruments is an easy one, and they're typically pretty expensive. You guys are filling that gap to, to make sure that the uh, young people are still getting that, that cultural immersion and education and uh, musical experience, and tie, tie it. I mean, it's a perfect tie. So find what that is for you uh, and run with it. 
and um, don't don't push the limits. If it really doesn't work, don't push the limits, but think about how you might be able to connect your mission to what's going on and make that argument about why what you do now is more important than ever before. So with that, I wanna uh, pass it off to Rudy and uh, let him chat for a few minutes and we'll head into Q and A. Hey, Justin, I think we can pack up and go home. That was really good. I mean, you know, it was a lot and you, you, you managed the time and you know, you, you gave us a lot there. So thanks. Um, thanks. Yeah, I was taking a few notes here. Um, hey, everyone, thanks. Um, uh, really glad to be on here. Hi uh, guys, American Philanthropic Philanthropy Daily and uh, glad to share a little bit of what we're um, doing at the Murdoch Trust and glad to answer questions. Um, just, just some, most of our time is gonna be Q&A so I'm just gonna hit you with a few bullet points. Um, some thoughts about uh, brief context. Murdoch Trust been around since 1975. This is our 45th year. Um, and I've been here for two years. As a program director, I evaluate grants with a, a team of 10 people. And before that, I was uh, fundraising, writing proposals, sending emails, letters, holding events, um, kids going to camp, kids going to college, all sorts of things. So um, glad for what I'm learning here and excited to share. A few, three things I'm thinking about for what fundraisers can do right now. Um, in terms of what should you be doing, um, I've been thinking about the word faithful um, in many contexts, uh, in my own faith, but also just in terms of the work that you are called to and also the work of your organization and your position. And, and Justin and Austin said it nicely, keep, keep doing it. Now you may have to pivot and customize a little bit, but what you're doing is important and we need your full energy um, your full vision, um, and yeah, work with your team to figure out how that pivots and what that feels like, but absolutely be faithful. Uh, when, when contacting foundations right now, I encourage you, read, read our website, read through it. Um, you'd be surprised at how many people actually don't go in, and, and you know, sometimes websites are not designed well. You got to click through. You know, our team's done a, I feel great about the, the job our team's done at Murdoch Trust, to give you a lot of information, really accessible. Um, but yeah, just read it because it comes across at some, whenever, whether in an email or, or a conversation, we can feel it. We can tell when you haven't really thought much about us, especially when we tried to put it out in front of you. And I'm like, okay, they're doing their job. They're trying to talk to 20 funders today. There's only so much time in the day. I have great sympathy for that, but it doesn't help if, if you don't access what we're putting out there. At Murdoch Trust, we have a page, murdochtrust.org slash COVID-19. And we are regularly updating it with what we are doing right now. And I'm gonna to get to that in a little bit. Um, uh, and also, also, sometimes you can also just Google, you know, put in the name of the foundation and hit the news tab, and you'll see immediate stuff uh, that the foundation's doing in the news right away. So at least you can, when you talk to the person, say, hey, I don't know everything, but I, I checked out your website. I think I understand where you're going. Saw the news bit, that was cool. I have one question for you, you know. That, that means a lot and, and it helps to make that personal connection. Um, and, and also, you know, uh, gosh, I mean, Austin, this is for a little bit later, kind of. It's one of my little tricks, but I'll just throw it in here. Um, well, I'll throw it in, in a second. Real quick, what not to do, I just said that. I'm, you make cold, if you're making a cold call and you haven't really looked at our material, then it's, you know, it can be a little frustrating. We're like, wow, it was right there at the website. And they were just like, and I get that too. You're busy and you're like, let me just pick up the phone and call the person. But in the same time, it says, it says something like how thoughtful are you about, not just us, but even about all of your planning as an organization. It, it raises a question. Um, other mistakes. Um, so when I get contacts, usually emails, um, sometimes a voicemail where the person is ambiguous. They're like, hey, I'd really like to talk to you. Can we get on the phone? Can we find a time to get on Zoom? And they don't say what it's about? Well, I, I, I have an, I and the trust, we have an interest. We wanna talk to people. We wanna find out what's going on. But it's difficult to know what to do with that. I mean, I don't know what I'm signing up for. And as Austin mentioned, I, I think all of us are, are busy and we have things on our plates that um, we didn't anticipate. You know, it's kind of double time and 
and that's for us as well. So when I get those, I'm like, wow, I don't know if I can deal with that right now. I put it to the side and then I keep addressing what's coming. If you were to come with something a little more direct, um, that, that helps me to contextualize. And frankly, I had one person who contacted me yesterday and they, they laid out very quickly. They said, we're dealing with something with food. We never anticipated it. I know we have a relationship with you on another project, but um, I'm just wondering if, if, if I can talk to you. And that was actually enough because they were a grantee. We know about them. And I emailed her back and I said, I have five minutes. Is that okay? And she said, yes. And so and she got on the phone and I said, just hit me between the eyes. I am all ears. I have five minutes. And then she just rattled it down. And I said, what's the cost? How long is it going to take? Who's involved? Anybody else going to fund it? I got to tell you, you know, at our, you know, at our website, how we're, how we're approaching things. And she says, yes, I know. I said, I thank you for this information. And I apologize. I only had five minutes, you know, so that was super helpful that the person was that clear and direct. I, I want to mention one thing here. I, I used to do this. I've done this a lot in magazine and newspaper writing. I've done it a little bit with fundraising and foundations, but, but just as a note, um, what I want to say is like, what's, what's happening for the person in my seat, the, pr the program officer of a foundation? What's the experience like? It's, it's similar to this. I used to be a magazine editor in the early 90s, right out of college. And there were, in our niche, there were a lot of people who wanted to get their stuff published in our magazine. So I had a constant stream of unsolicited magazine articles. And I would just keep a pile. And, you know, we had a standard letter, you know, thank you for your submission. Um, you know, we, we don't know if we can do anything with it. But I had a pile. And invariably, every time we had an issue about to get printed, uh, something would fall off. An article wasn't vetted or the writer wanted something else. And I had a blank page. And I had two days to print run. And we had thousands of dollars that were going to go out on this thing. So I didn't have time to commission an article. I would go into my pile and see how complete, I'd have to get two things, a good article that I could stick into the magazine so that it was, it was, it was complete. And that's the key word, complete. The other thing is I, I wanted to know if the, if the writer was easy to work with or not. Um, I, I have another colorful world, word that comes to mind that I'm not going to use. But if I knew that, that the writer was going to, I could, I could work with them, they were going to work with me and I could get this thing done, um, I was inclined to go with that. My, my statement to you is this. For example, I'm not inviting this. Uh, we have a focus on the Pacific Northwest. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, wow, you know, that's definitely our, our focus area. But if you were to send me something it would be very helpful if you kept it on one page. But, and this is if it's cold. You don't know the people at all. Okay. You send one page. Here's the issue we're dealing with. Here's the line item of the costs. Here's who else is involved. Here's our balance sheet. And here's how it's going to live after it's over. If I had all that on one page, that's kind of, I can see you. I can see your organization. Your balance sheet, you know, the numbers say so much. Um, who else is involved is a really big deal. Line item of the budget, what are we talking about here? And line item is important because sometimes, you know, people pick and choose. Um, and then a short project, project description. I, I don't need a long description for me. I mean, if we ever start take it to stage two, I can call you and get a very long description. But so, and then, and then finally, your willingness to send it and, and not to sort of pressure the people, but just to be real nice. You know, I'd be like, hey, Austin, here's a one pager. I'm not in Philadelphia, but here's a deal. I've got a guy down in Chester. We're doing these things. Um, hey, no pressure. I know you're busy, Austin. You know, no pressure, but thanks, thanks for your attention. Austin doesn't reply. Three weeks later, one sentence. Hey, Austin, I sent you that thing about Chester. 
any hope? It's just, for me, that's an acknowledgement. That feels relational. That's an acknowledgement that whatever's going on on your end, you're a person, you probably got a lot of stuff happening. I kind of broke your rule. You don't really want unsolicited stuff. But, and I'm nice. Hey, thank you for your time. Um, I just wanted to say that. I, one of the great joys I have in taking this position is sharing with my friends in the nonprofit world, my peers, little things that I'm learning. And I just want to, uh, finally, I just want to reiterate what both Austin and Justin said. Uh, there are people, great people on the other side. Um, I know it's frustrating when you don't get an answer from a foundation or, or they're not, or they're kind of cryptic in their communications. I know that's frustrating, but you do have people there who care deeply and we're all challenged right now. Our pain is nowhere near the pain of so many people, but we're watching a lot of stuff that it's, it's difficult to be connected to so many needs and to feel like, wow, we, how much can we do in the midst of that? So that's one reason I'm really glad to be here with you in this, um, in this dialogue. Awesome, thanks Rhea, that was excellent. Uh, thank you, Justin, for your remarks too. We've got a lot of questions coming in please keep sending them. This is uh, super helpful uh, and a lot of overlap, which is always good to see because we know people are struggling with some of the same thing uh, and we can knock out several at the same time. I'm going to start uh, right at the top. Um, Rudy, you might want to stab, take a stab at this first, but I think uh, Justin might as well. Um, so this organization has a, a foundation that gave them a large grant for a program that they run in Southern California uh, because of the lockdown and everything. They've had to cancel the program and they want to um, change the, you know, convert the funds to do something closer to the organization's headquarters in another area in California, which is outside of that foundation's giving zone, um, I guess geographical. So they want to know if they can, if they think the foundation will still support it. What do you think, Rudy? Um, my hunch is, so for us, we, uh, we've had grantees who have asked if, if uh, they could have different terms of their current grant with us. And what we do there illuminates that well, the spirit of the grant needs to remain the same. So we are not converting uh, grants that are for specific projects into general operating funds. That's what the trust, that's the trust's approach right now. I am aware of other foundations that are doing that. And, and they've stated that on their websites where they're making that conversion. In terms of the, the region, I, that's another principle that we have where if somebody says, hey, we're national, we've got an Oregon project with you, but we really need it in Texas. Um, again, the, the spirit of the grant and the focus of the grant for us, um, we would not do that. But, but here's something I would suggest. Um, if you contact the foundation and lead with a statement that acknowledging that you are fully aware, this is outside of your giving area. And my understanding is that um, it would not be possible to do that, you know, demonstrate your knowledge and then go ahead and say, however, it doesn't hurt to ask, is there any hope for doing that? Or do you have other resources at your foundation or are you aware of other resources? Thank you so much for your time. So I think that's just acknowledging what, what they've stated um, would be helpful. Awesome. Um, this is, uh, again, largely for you, Rudy. Um, have you heard that, uh, or, or Justin too, but have you heard that foundations are open to meeting virtually, say uh, via Zoom in place of in-person meetings, um, but especially with prospects? So maybe Rudy, are you open to Zoom meetings with current or prospective grantees? Yes, um, short answer, yes. We've had to do that um, because of what's going on. I, I can tell you that our process is that with every proposal that gets past the LOI stage, we do a site visit. So we are going around the Pacific Northwest anyway. And I had to cancel a number of my site visits at the onset, you know, when this all turned, turned the page. Um, and I've been doing tons of these Zoom meetings and, you know, not an expert yet, but we've, we've all had to do this. And so, yeah, even with, and I actually prefer when we finally do a meeting, I do prefer Zoom. It's not in person, but it's not audio. At least I can see your face and you can see mine. It is something. So we're very open to it. 
Yeah, and I, I actually have interacted with a few uh, programs, foundations, organizations recently, and they said the same thing. I've gotten on calls with them. They said, oh, I just finished our virtual, you know, on-site visit and virtual walkthrough. And they got on FaceTime and walked through the office. And then they set up the Zoom in the conference room and had the relevant staff there. So oh, we got to pivot to the times. And I, I think folks like Rudy and others are, are very open to it. Excellent. Uh, a, a lot of questions around um, communicating the importance of your mission if it's not providing COVID relief, not doing health and human services or something like that. It doesn't feel urgent. Uh, any thoughts on that? I think um, I would say two things, and this is a little bit of the faithfulness part. Um, so A, I, I see that a lot. We see that a lot. It's a very real situation and I can imagine how frustrating it is. B, um, this thing is rolling out. It is April 9th. Um, we don't know what's going to be happening in the next few months. We don't know what's going to happen next week. So I think that the clarity of who you are would be helpful. Again, I'll just say it in terms of if I saw something come across my desk. And, uh, you know, actually what we're seeing is we're seeing uh, so many requests for emergency funding or replacement funding, especially because people had they rely on a big fundraiser and, um, and they can't ha have it. So right now, the, the trust is not doing that, um, any emergency or replacement. We're focusing on COVID response. We, we have, in terms of resources, we've, we've connected our grantees and others with um, sort of best practices. And even, even at, at that COVID-19 website, as we learn about uh, operating funds, emergency funds, and other uh, foundations across the Pacific Northwest especially, we list them there with links to the site. Now, I think what I would suggest is um, go ahead and, and let people know and, and just lead and say, I know you're into COVID, focus on COVID response and you know, your website says that. I would like to share this with you um, with that understanding. And, and please know that uh, um, we do see a need and this is why we see the need. Uh, and again, if you can throw in some numbers, that will always strengthen your case. Um, and then I think I would encourage you just to check back. And again, it can just be a short email. Hey, has anything changed? Hope you're well. Or, you know, it may not remember me, I reattached it. Um, so short term, it's frustrating. I think long term, for example, I, I've, I've spoken to no one about this um, in the foundation world, but what happens in New York City if all these kids have to stay home? How are parents gonna go back to work when they have to watch kids? It's a million kids in the public school system alone. So I imagine that there are people thinking about how to create supports, um, opportunities for children you know, in, in COVID. And if you have a human services organization with youth, children and youth, um, it may take a few months, but it'll come to fruition. Um, and my final point with that, it'll really help if you can show your planning. And, and that's challenging right now. I mean, you're just putting out some fires, but show your planning, that your board is on board, your team is aligned. And it's not just planning for the next three months, that you are thinking about this over a longer term. That, that isn't merely to please a foundation or to please me. But we what we see is that when you have that thoughtfulness, it really does change things for your organization. It changes the trajectory. It opens up more possibilities, uh, the, the more planning that you have. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, just one quick answer here to one of them. A lot of uh, 990s say that they only give to pre-selected organizations. Is it okay to reach out? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, most, I think, say you, they only give to pre-selected organizations, but you can uh, you can't not get in touch. That does raise the question, though, uh, you know, largely for you, Justin, helping organizations with this, but you, Rudy, how you like to receive these inquiries. What are some good tips for doing that? Um, and especially someone who says they're just starting a grants program right now. What are some tips for reaching out to funders, uh, and where can they look to find funders who might be interested? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, 
Regarding your first point about, yes, how to reach out to or, or reflect on the fact that some of these 990s, a lot of them say only pre-selected organizations and don't contact. Uh, as you said, Austin, I, I think you, you, you power through. Um, how do you, the only, there's only one way to become a pre-selected organization that is to be selected. <laughs> and how do you get selected is they learn about you and they like you and they agree with your mission. Uh, if everyone in the world had an option to say, uh, no, no one's ever allowed to email, mail me, email me. Well, almost everyone would check that box, like just reduce our communications. Many are doing that, just reduce communications. And for a lot of foundations on top of that, it's, it is a, it, it's a slog. They're getting, you got to think about this. If someone's got a $5 million grant making foundation, um, you realistically, they're getting dozens, if not over a hundred proposals a year. And they're having to go through that. And it's just a lot of work for them. So a lot of it is just, you know, right to the circular bin. And so the ones that keep on popping up that are persistent, they start to rise to the top of that pile and, and someone will take notice. So the key with those foundations is, is persistence. Um, and so anyway, keep that in mind. Um, if you wanna be sensitive to that, you can, you can acknowledge it in your letter. I wouldn't necessarily say you need to do this, but you could acknowledge in your LOI and say, I saw in your 990 that, you know, you, uh, you really only give to pre-selected organizations. However, and this is important, I also saw in your 990 that you give to A, B, and C, and I'd love to tell you how we think our mission fits into those, you know, A, B, and C, and how it might fit into your philanthropic portfolio um, and try to, try to bridge that there. Um, and then resources for um, finding foundations that might fit your mission, there, there's a number of them. If you just guide star, you can, you can look up foundations, you can do searches for free. Um, Foundation Center is another good one uh, that is, is paid for the most part. Um, the other one is working with firms like ours, American Philanthropic, and asking us to use all of our resources. We have uh, several paid subscriptions to different things, um, and we can go through and do that, you know, uh, basically backtrack and say, okay, who are the, type in queries into these subscriptions and say, who are the organizations giving to A, B, and C type things? And at what levels, and we can kind of uh, reverse engineer that and then come back and say, we did our work and here are the 10 foundations that we think are hot leads for you. Uh, Cause they give in your, in the range that you're looking for to the organizations similar to yours with missions. So one, you can do that grunt work, Guide Star, Foundation Center, a couple others, or uh, really, yeah, hire a researcher or firm to help uh, populate those leads for you. Rudy, I don't know if you have anything on that. No, that's good stuff. I, you know, two things. I. I have a friend, and uh, he might even be on this call. He's from back east. He was kind of a machine. He, he showed me a spreadsheet one day. He was the, the grant writer. He had like 90 hot prospects. Um, and then he had another list. And they were all in the area. He had done the research. It was a lot of work he did. It was like a really long-term paper in a way. And then what was interesting was that he just was consistent in communicating, applying where he could, um, not random. I mean, it was a lot of work. He had to give special attention to everybody, but he developed his own system. And I watched him year over year. Uh, so short term, you know, we, we have a lot of short term things to say here. In the long term, as you continue to gather names and prospects and communicate with them, and keep going with your communication, your planning. Um, um, I think that's just some basic human stuff. I think I just want to encourage you. Maybe I mean, you probably already know that everybody, but we've seen that. I think the other thing I want to say is uh, if you're brand new and you're actually trying to get attention, I, I learned something when I was in Michigan. I mean, I'm from Los Angeles, lifelong. I was in Michigan for nine years. Now I've been out here in the Pacific Northwest for two years. I learned something in Michigan. There was a, I was fundraising. There was a big donor who I'd been trying to get a meeting with them. Couldn't find any way at all. I get a call on my cell phone. It's him. He's driving and he says, Rudy, I love it. I'm listening to your lecture. This is the best. I love it. I need more. Can we meet? And I said, well, sure, Mr. Big Donor. Yeah, let's do it. And like, I'll be in Chicago in two weeks. So we meet. I have no idea why this guy wants to meet. He doesn't tell me. And again, I'm looking at him and going, that's a big fish who doesn't have time for anybody. It turned out that there was one word, deal flow. 
deal flow. And I'm like, deal flow? What are you talking about? Business guy, investor. We, uh, my org was in a, a global network, uh, ending poverty through business, my previous org. Um, we had a partner in Haiti, a lot of businesses in Haiti. And uh, this, this man had invested in one business in Haiti and he wanted to invest in more businesses. And he knew that my organization had a wide network of businesses that we partnered with, mentored, training, that sort of thing. And so I said, this guy has apparently everything in the world except the next deal, the next investment, the next breakthrough. And so I thought, you know, that's gonna, it, it made sense for other things. So th this, is, this is what I'm saying. I believe even the person who's told you no, go away, we don't wanna hear from anybody, you have a minute or two to look at a deal. Now this is again where the completeness of the deal comes in. I mean, maybe you have some proprietary stuff you don't wanna share. Okay, you know, that, that's, you'll figure that out. But if you put together an interesting idea, even if it's not to fund your org, even if you just serve up something, hey man, Rudy told me about you, my org works with kids in Tennessee, I'd love for you to fund us, but that's not why I'm calling, because I read your website, you don't do Tennessee. I thought of something. I have two guys in Haiti and they're doing the deal. This is their website. You might be interested. It's a little hit or miss, but sometimes people call you back because why you're a source of a lot of things, connections, good information, you're thoughtful, and they may, they may want to know a little bit more about your charity. That's a little hit or miss. You know, the percentages aren't high. But I've had a few beautiful things come through my life because of that method. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, like, you know, like Justin was saying earlier, we want to see, think of it as a two-way street. What value can you provide to your donor too? Um, and then, the, you know, the story about your friend with the spreadsheet and sticking out after you get to know Rudy. Uh, at, at American Philanthropic, we always say the not so secret key to fundraising success is doing uh, the right things the right way consistently over time. And fundraising is so much of just plodding away, doing the same thing over and over, being consistent and persistent uh, and strategic about it. Um, and a big spreadsheet, we have uh, a lot of big spreadsheets with a lot of names and phone numbers and you call over and over and that's how it goes. Um, another one here is this kind of a tough question so I'm curious to see where you guys go. Uh, do you have recommendations for talking about endowments that have lost most of their gains from last year uh, and how to leverage that when fundraising? So if you have an endowed fund that spins off uh, interest, which is used for scholarships, say for students or programs, something, um, those smaller endowments are going to be uh, uh, spinning off a lot less. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, it's a tough situation to be in primarily because you're Used to seeing those fun, funds come in, been a bull market for a while here, um, you know, and it's been fueling programs. I, I get it. I, I, uh, it's really tough. And I work with some organizations that are in that exact situation. Uh, so, yeah, there, there is a way to, to spin that for fundraising. Uh, be curious, you know, if Rudy has anything from a foundation side, the program officer side, but from the fundraiser side, uh, I'd spin that and now. And, and, probably would start with some of my current donors, foundation donors or, or individual major donors and go to them and say, you're intimately involved with our, with our mission and our programs. You know what we do. Um, here's the situation. You probably know some of this from, from your, our financials. You know, we're able to fund this program with that $50,000 that we peel off from that endowment every year. Uh, we, just, we just took a hit. There is zero chance unless the market picks up there's zero chance we're going to peel off anything uh, from this. If we do, we're talking about a thousand or two, uh, but nothing near 50,000. Uh, as you know, this program's vital to what we do. It's one of our core programs. We, we don't want to let it go. We're, we're, we've positioned the organization and this program to be sustainable by itself with, through this endowment. It's not that during this time of crisis. Will you fill that gap? And, and turn at this story so the donor here is the hero you know you're making the foundation is the hero rudy's the hero rudy you know through your work with working with us on on this you can keep this program alive and vibrant uh through this crisis and when we're through and the markets come back and we're back on a bull market you know we'll, we'll the endowment will pick up right where it left off um that's the approach i would take rudy i'd be curious if you no that's that sounds very good i i think um 
I'll tell you the inner monologue. I'm listening to somebody share that question. And what I'm thinking about is, what's the board doing? You know, so tell me what the board is doing about this endowment. Um, who else is involved? Who else are you asking? Okay. And what's your plan with the endowment going forward? You know, what, what are the specific details? Are, are you, is the idea that you're going to you know, leave everything and, and wait for it to come back? Are you getting any counsel about, um, you know, what your options are? Uh, so knowing, it's sort of narrative and numbers is what I always think about these days. So yes, the story, the need, and the opportunity for the funder to fill that gap, but throw the numbers and run the numbers out longer term. You know, long term, we do, um, we do into the board. A, a, anytime you can say the board is much stronger. The board's talked and the board says, you know, for right now, for all the information we have, we're going to continue. We know that the, that the, you know, with our investment strategy, but we're, we're talking weekly, monthly with our advisors. So we just want to know that there, there's a light on, you know, somebody's looking, you know, steering the wheel there and you're being very thoughtful. Again, it speaks back to your planning. So, um, yeah, just adding that to what you shared, Justin. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, this is another great question for Rudy and might be our last one. Uh, but since Murdoch has a regional focus, um, we work in several different states. Uh, so what suggestions do you have for applying to regional grantors? Namely, should you start with the overall goal and then go down to the region or just jump right into the uh, specific region that overlaps with the foundation interest? You know, okay. Justin, I committed a, a sin here. I was reading that same question, I think, while you were talking. So would you say it again? I think it's the last one there. We're in the Pacific Northwest in Seattle. Is it that question? Uh, no, so a slightly different one. Um, okay. So if this organization works in uh, several different states, but wants to pr uh, approach a regional funder, um, should they lead with the overall mission and then jump down to the region? Or should they start with uh, just jump right into the regional overlap? Well, I, I think um, y you'll probably have time to share all of that. It depends on if you're writing a letter or if you're talking to them. But I think you can kind of say it in a short way. I mean, we have a number of groups that are national, and then but they approach us for a regional project. So you can just say it. You know, we're like American Philanthropic. We cover the country, you know. And, you know, we have, you know, 10,000 clients, you know, with all this. Right now in Pacific Northwest, we have, you know, a thousand and we want to expand that to 2000. Can we talk? You know, I'm, so, but we need to know, we need to know the national context. We need to know how it all fits. So, um, but yeah, I think, yeah, we need to hear it all. Great. Uh, one final quick one then as uh, we approach the end, as organizations are looking at loss of value of their investments, would foundations be interested in offering lines of credit to help short-term cash flow? for capital projects. Yeah. And even, even beyond that, I would uh, say, you know, just not even loss of investments, but just loss of potential donations. I, I, we really don't know where or how found, uh, funding will drop here, uh, if and how it will drop here this year or next year. So, but everyone's anticipating some sort of drop in building contingency plans, uh, assuming something, five to 10 or 20%, who knows. Um, so it's two things. One, yes, loss of investments, but two, just potential uh, losses in, in donations. Um, yeah, and if you're like many nonprofits, you don't have $10 million sitting in, in the bank that you know, can hold you over for the next three months. If you're like mo most organizations, you probably have yeah, a month, two months, three months, um, most maybe, or many have maybe six months to a year at most of cash reserves. Um, and so you're looking at what's going on and saying, boy, um, foundations, might, uh, my investments are gone. Donations might start drying up. How do I keep this, this, this organization going? Uh, I, don't, I don't have two years or a year or whatever of cash. So that's a great question. One, I would say, uh, I would recommend going to your board first and foremost. Hopefully your board is, and I recommend this a lot, your board is, uh, looks at your organization as a top three priority and, and uh, maybe top five at most. And so if they're on your board, it's a top priority, which means they're giving top dollars to you and go to them and say, you guys know what's going on here. You know the situation. We need $100,000 to get us through the next you know, month or two months before we have a clear outlook on the economy and, and donations. 
uh, can you do that? I would get the board to try to step up first. They're, mo they're the most invested. It's what Rudy just said, where's the board? Um, if you can get them, let's say you need 200 grand, just to pick a number, you need 200 grand, you can get 50 to 100 from your board. I might go to a few major don'ts and say, can you step up and fill this gap? Um, a combination of giving earlier, giving more, something along those lines. Uh, personally, as a fundraiser, I'd probably go to foundations last as a, with a question in terms of credit or loan, I would use it as a last resort and try to find some other avenues. Um, but if you really have to, yeah. I mean, I, I've worked with organizations that have gone to uh, uh, major donors and they give them a very low percentage loan to get them through a few months. I've worked with organizations that have gotten some sort of line of credit, but I'd probably resort to who's in your inner circle here, who's closest to you first. Yeah. And, you know, in answer to your question, the, um, what you said about a line of credit from a foundation is the first time I'm hearing that idea. It's not an, anything that we've discussed, um, um, here at the trust and we're right now we're continuing with our regular grants program um, as well as um, looking at emergency looking at COVID-19 response efforts that are going on and again at our web page we've listed a number of those categories that we're working on um, I think uh, Justin it's great going to the board um, we'll, it's sort of twofold you need immediate you know support but it's also an opportunity to, again, do that longer term planning and the capacity building internally, um, maybe to ask some deeper questions. Um, I remember I, ran, I was executive director in, in Pasadena, California um, of a nonprofit. And in times like this is unusual, this is unusually difficult. But in other difficult times, it was often a chance to look a little deeper at some things that were going on with our organization, things that we could strengthen or even things that we had to set aside. Um, and so um, I think that will be helpful. Uh, and so even as you approach others for funding um, and starting with your board, they might have some fresh new ideas. They might have had a side of money on, on the side that they weren't telling anybody about. I've had that more than a couple of times. I said, you, you really should have come forward about a year ago <laughs> before a crisis. We needed it then, but thankful that you're willing to be open about um, a resource that, that and to share that. So I, again, yeah, really, really starting with the board and, and actually asking them that question. If we can't get a line of credit from a foundation, um, are there banks, are there other entities that would be willing to do that? Awesome. Great. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, we'll wrap it up there. Next week, we're back with uh, data analytics and strategic planning. Uh, and also next week, we're hosting our first industry-specific webinar for uh, fundraisers in higher education. So Friday uh, 2 o'clock, Friday next week at 2 o'clock Eastern time, we'll be talking about the unique challenges uh, colleges and universities are facing. You can go to uh, the events tab at AmericanPhilanthropic.com to find more info and register there. I also want to quickly mention American Philanthropic's talent pool. Uh, if anything about the current crisis has you thinking about a new job, we collect resumes, which we regularly review when we're helping our clients with recruiting and hiring, which we do uh, frequently. You can enter some info about yourself, upload your resume, uh, and you'll be right on our radar for open jobs. We even still have a few client openings right now, which are also available online. Thank you again to Justin and Rudy. Uh, to everyone else, good luck, be well, 